about diets and nutrition at the zoo. If you guys were fans of Zoo School Live, then you may have tuned in for our commissary tour where we met with Ian, um, who's our commissary keeper, and some of our vet staff, and learned all about where all of our diets are prepped, and even some of the ingredients. Today we're going to focus a little bit more on some of the aspects of an animal's history we might look at, or their biology, in order to understand better why they eat what they do, and how we can make that as close to their natural diet as possible. So to start off, I've got a lot of cool stuff on this table here. We're going to take a look at some different types of skulls and some different types of diets. At our zoo, we have a lot of different species, and we have to consider a lot of factors when we're caring for so many different types of animals. And we might look at where they are naturally found, what kind of habitats, because they might not be exposed to certain types of fruits or vegetables in that normal habitat, so they may not be used to eating certain foods. We have to look at how they hunt or how they find food. Are they predators? Would they prefer to chase down something and grab it? Or are they browsing animals that maybe spend all day long traveling short distances, maybe eating the tops of trees and things like that? So all those factors help us decide what we want to feed the animals. We're going to start off looking at some animal teeth and talking about the three main groups of diet. Um, you were probably familiar with these. We have carnivores, omnivores, and herbivores. So to start off, we're going to start with carnivores. They are our meat-eating animals. And when we think of carnivores, we're often going to think of big cats, maybe wolves, coyotes. We're going to think of raptors, like birds of prey. So these animals are going to pretty much always be hunting for other animals to eat. Now we can tell a lot about an animal's diet by looking at their teeth. If we start with a carnivore, probably the most obvious types of their teeth are going to be these really big sharp ones in the front. Those are called their canines. Now many different types of animals have canines, not just carnivores. In fact, you have canines at home that help you to rip and tear up different types of food. But they're the most obvious, the biggest on our carnivore species. They're gonna have really large canines. Now in the front, they may not have very, very big teeth because those teeth, those front teeth are called your incisors. Those are gonna be for chomping. So not very helpful on an animal that's ripping and tearing. And then in the back, we have teeth called molars and premolars. On a carnivore animal, a meat-eating animal, they're going to be uh, very sharp and pointy. They're kind of like shears or scissors. They're going to help to rip and shred apart different parts of meat and fur and bone and all kinds of stuff. So when we're looking at a, an animal and we know it's a carnivore, it's going to have teeth designed for ripping, shredding, and tearing. And we want to make sure we prepare a diet that fits that. So here at the zoo, we have many different kinds of whole prey, uh, rats and different kinds of um, birds and fish, and we would give those animals meat products to survive. We would not necessarily give them a salad. We know that their teeth are designed for ripping and shredding, and they are naturally going to hunt for food. They want to eat meat. Now, the other side of that, we have herbivores. And herbivores are animals that are going to eat plant material. And our biggest example of an herbivore here at Elma Park Zoo is our giraffe. So, like our carnivores, they're going to have different types of teeth. They're going to have some molars and premolars, remember in the back. These are going to be, instead of sharp and pointy, they're going to be almost kind of ridged and flat and very wide. And this will help them to grind their food. So it will take the leaves and any of the branch material and kind of move them between those little ridges to grind them up into small pieces. Think about you, when you eat food, you're probably going to bite off a big piece with the front and then grind it between your back teeth. Speaking of the front teeth, our giraffes are going to be a little interesting. They're not going to have front teeth on the top, so they have no incisors and no canines. You don't see very long dagger-like teeth on a giraffe. On the top of their mouth, they're actually going to have a hard palate, so kind of like a grinding stone almost up there. But they do have really big incisors. These are for chewing and chomping off pieces of the plant. So when you're talking about an herbivore, a plant-eating species, they're going to use big chomping teeth and they're going to use big grinding teeth. They're not going to need to have teeth for ripping and tearing necessarily. Another good example of an um, herbivore is a rabbit. So they're going to have two pairs of incisors. You can see top and bottom. And the really interesting thing with rabbit teeth is that they don't really stop growing. They are rootless teeth. So they continue to grow out of the top of their head throughout the course of their whole life. Similar to our rodents like squirrels and chipmunks and porcupines. 
But you can see they also have those wide teeth with ridges, those wide incisors for grinding in the back too, because they are going to eat primarily plant material. And then our last group, but not least, is going to be omnivores. So omnivores eat both a mixture of plant material and animal material. The omnivore we're going to meet today would have a skull that looks like this. So they're going to have kind of a mixture of all the different teeth. They're going to have canines for ripping and tearing. So you can see those sharp pointy teeth. They're going to have incisors for chomping, sometimes pretty big in the front. And then their molars and premolars might be a mixture of wide and pointy. So this animal is definitely going to eat a mixture of maybe fruits, vegetables, berries, leaves, and then also small insects and other small animals. So an omnivore, think of it as om nom 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 nom, they eat anything and everything. Now within those groups, you can have further specifics. Um, a really good example of a generalist omnivore is the raccoon. So raccoons are known for not being picky eaters. They will eat any types of fruits, vegetables, plants, materials that they find, including um, stuff left behind by humans. So maybe they're eating our trash or our fast food we've thrown out or leftover pet food. Um, they eat other material from animals like bugs and small creatures and eggs. So they are an omnivore, but they also have a very wide diet. Some omnivores are going to be a little more picky. They're going to want to eat specific things. We also have an example of a specialist that's kind of breaking from the mold. When we talk about koalas, they're going to have these really big incisors that almost look kind of scary sharp. But that doesn't mean they're eating meat. Just because their teeth are very sharp and designed for kind of shredding, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a carnivore. They're actually going to be an herbivore, but they're a specialist. They're eating a very specific type of plant. They're eating eucalyptus, which can be very hard for them to chew and break down. So they need specialized teeth. And that's pretty much the only thing they eat. So when it comes to surviving, the generalist is usually going to have a better chance of adapting to new places compared to the koala or the specialist in this case. And we have to consider that at the zoo, too. If you bring in a koala into your care at the zoo and you try to feed it other things, um, it could be hard to keep alive and keep healthy. Whereas a raccoon, you could probably offer it just about anything and it would do okay. Now, we want to take in consideration not just what they're eating, but also how much of it. In a zoo setting, many times our animals aren't as active as they might be in the wild. They don't have to chase down their prey and they don't have to forage across miles of habitat. So we want to make sure that not only is it the right type of food, but the right amount. Um, so we do have specialized diets for some of our animals. To give you guys an example of how much some of our animals eat, we have our giraffe here. If you've come to the zoo, you've probably got to participate in a giraffe feed. One of our giraffes can easily go through a whole case of romaine lettuce in a day. But they also get on top of that about 10 pounds of something called wild herbivore. So this is wild herbivore, and it's a grain diet. And it has all the different kinds of uh, vitamins and minerals and things packed in there and they get 10 pounds of this that's a whole lot of feed in one day on top of that they're also getting browse so different branches and and some alfalfa hay and things like that for them to scavenge um, throughout the day in their enclosure and then if we take a look at our blue and gold macaw they're going to get a mixture of fresh fruits and vegetables as well as some grains and they can even get hard boiled egg because macaws have beaks that are designed to help crush and break apart fruits and nuts. So we have to kind of replicate that as best we can in a zoo setting. We want them to eat fresh fruits and nuts, um, but we also want them to get all the different nutrition they would find in natural uh, plant life. So they do get a grain diet as well. But we wouldn't want to feed them the same thing we might feed an eagle, which has a similar hooked beak just designed for a different purpose. Eagles are going to have beaks for ripping and shredding fish. Macaws and other parrots are going to have sharp hooks that are very powerful for crushing and ripping apart fruits and nuts. So we can look at beak shape as well when we're talking about animals and what they might eat here at the zoo and in the wild. So our last animal um, nutrition example we have is our omnivore. So we talked about the giraffe, they get 10 pounds of wild herbivore. Our blue and gold macaw gets a mixture of fruits and vegetables. We have so many different types of, of food here. This is called sweet feed, which goes to some of our herbivores as well. We have rodent block. If you guys have tuned in for Pokey the Porcupine or Felici, you guys are familiar with this. We have, uh, I think this is our monkey biscuit for some of our um, smaller primates. And then a leaf eater biscuit, which I believe our um, friend Flash the Red Panda gets some of this stuff. 
So these are all different types of uh, created diets, but we also include fresh fruits and things. For our animal friend today, I'm going to show you guys an example here real quick of what he is going to be getting. So his is more of a fresh mixture of things. We have some lettuce, some green pepper, um, some crickets in there, some dog kibble, and then also some little bits of ground meat. So this is an omnivore diet. It has both plants and animal material, and it is for our little friend Pesto, the striped skunk, because he is an omnivore, and he is very excited to come out and meet you guys today. So we're going to give him a chance to explore for some of his diet, because in the wild, a uh, skunk like Pesto would spend most of the evening digging around, trying to find food, exploring different places, and we want to give him that same exercise and enrichment here at the zoo. But we also use his food for training, so um, we can build a relationship with him using that as well. So this is his very first time coming out anywhere on Facebook. Um, or even for programming, he came to the zoo about two months ago, not quite, a month and a half ago. And so we're really excited to share him with you guys. So I'm going to scatter some of the food. i got to put some gloves on first. And we've got a couple little hides set up here. We've got some paper we can put in there too. So we're going to try to make it as exciting for him as possible. And we'll talk a little bit about his nutrition in general since he is so growing. very soon. Puzzle feeders are a great way to keep animals excited and active and exploring. We've got some snacks hidden in this box here with some shredded paper because skunks love to dig. And then some stuff scattered along there too. We'll scatter a little bit more. All right. Some of the good stuff out there too. All right, Pesto, are we ready to come out and say hi? I'm very excited for this. the last two weeks, um, three weeks, I guess, to get him excited and used to people. So he's got a couple people he works with specifically here right now, and then eventually we'll be introducing him to others. You can see him using that puzzle feeder there. So to give you a, a, an idea of how big he is um, and how much he's grown in the last month, um, when Pesto arrived, he could fit in uh, the palm of our hand. Hi, I know. Um, and now he's a little bit too big to do that. He weighs about um, one and a half pounds. So he's really not that big compared to how much he will grow. Um, and let's see if we can get him to come over and say hi. There you go. So we've been working on him getting comfortable in the zoo. Um, we do spend as much time as possible with him to make sure he knows that people are fun to be around <laughs> um, and make sure that uh, he associates positive things with the public and with, with his trainers especially because his job is going to be meeting the public. Um, so we use his food to reward him, but we've also started giving him an opportunity to forage as I mentioned before. We want him to explore like a wild skunk might um, and use his little mind and his body and get some exercise trying to find his food because we have, um, you know, as much as we love him to spend time with us at the zoo, we want him to be able to keep himself occupied as well too. You can see he's using those strong legs. <laughs> Skunks have really strong front legs and back legs. Um, they're excellent diggers. 
So he's going to use those claws. Oh, there you go. Good job, buddy. He's going to use those claws to get into those small spaces. So when we give him enrichment, um, we use a lot of these puzzle feeders, little balls, boxes with stuff hidden in it. Um, we try to encourage those natural behaviors. So not only do we want to make sure that his diet fits what he would be eating in the wild, we want to encourage the, the foraging behavior we would see in the wild too. So we don't just hand him a big bowl full of food. We try to spread it out. We try to give him an opportunity to sniff around, use that excellent sense of smell and use his muscles and, and his little mind. So you can see now he's finally figured out there's some good snacks in there. This is especially important for a baby animal. We wanna make sure just like, you know, when you're younger or you, if you have kids or siblings at home, their young years are really valuable. That's when they're learning how to move their bodies and grow stronger. That's how they're kind of exploring their environment. So for us, it's really important to make sure we encourage play and exploration with Pesto at an early age so that he can be confident when he grows up. <laughs> now he's really gotten into the box. He's, he's really enjoying himself now, which is so cute. So as I said, we give him a mixture of fruits, vegetables, some kibble, some crickets. Um, I believe we um, just started trying some, some mealworms. I brought crickets today. No mealworms right now. Um, and then we'll kind of introduce him to some other things too. These guys will eat small mice and um, small snakes and frogs and all kinds of stuff in the wild. So it's good to give him a variety, but we have to also be careful. He is still growing. We want to make sure that he gets all the right nutrition, not too much of the good stuff. Speaking of good stuff, I do have his absolute favorite snack over here with me today, his applesauce. So we do use applesauce to encourage him to come a little bit closer to us. So we'll let him finish digging out whatever he's found in there. And then I'll see if he wants to come over a little bit closer. Pesto, oh, did you find your snack? Hey, huh? Yeah, come on over here. <laughs> so Pesto, like I said, is only about three months old. He'll grow quite a significantly um, bigger than this in the next few uh, weeks. Full size, they can be several pounds. Good job, buddy. Um, we've also been working on doing some touch with him. So skunks are not necessarily like your cat or dog. They don't necessarily enjoy being touched, but because he lives at the zoo where he'll need eventually some vet care and he needs procedures done and he has to meet lots of people to help them learn, it's important for us to introduce these types of um, situations to him in a positive way. So he gets lots of good snacks, he really likes applesauce, he really likes wet cat food, and while he's young and growing, it's okay for us to give him all those different things. Um, but as he gets bigger, we'll have to start to, to restrict those funny things a little bit more. So we'll just see if he wants to step up for me. We do work a little bit on touch and picking him up and putting him back down. Oops, and getting him caught in my hair. <laughs> Again, we try to make this as positive as possible um, so that Pesto can do the best job he can in his role as an ambassador. And we really, really love, you know, working with skunks and opossums and these animals that are often misunderstood. Skunks may be a little threatening to people because they do spray if they feel totally scared and need to defend themselves. But for the most part, they like to go about their lives and not bother people at all. So they're a great animal to teach about. They share our personal habitats, especially in this area, and they do provide us a lot of service. So they do eat a lot of pest species like different insects and mice and even things like snakes and frogs that maybe you're not a big fan of hanging out in your backyard. So they're a very important part of our food chain to help uh, keep our native backyard habitats healthy. So despite the fact that sometimes they can be a little bit scary, um, because of their stinky smell. They're actually very important animals to have around. And so they make great educational ambassadors. So Pesto will, um, this is his first Facebook debut. He'll start doing some small programs on site, um, hopefully sooner than later with uh, some of our campers and things like that. And then eventually he'll come out for the public view. We try to do everything in very small increments so that he can get comfortable and confident as an ambassador. Um, we don't want to just throw him out there into the big world. 
because you will learn quickly and learn better if you give it a chance to kind of make those little steps. Let's let him come back down here. I know you want to finish your applesauce. <laughs> He's a very graceful creature. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm not sure if we've gotten any questions yet today on pesto, but if you guys have anything you want to know about him as we, um, you know, as you watch throughout the day, oops, sorry, buddy, feel free to put them in the comments and I'll hop on and answer. Um, we, we love sharing our uh, different aspects of animal keeping over the past couple weeks. We're going to continue to do Camp Keeper. Uh, for a few more and we're really excited that we got to share Pesto's first big day with you on Facebook and we hope that you guys will tune in again next week. We'll be continuing our lessons and learning a little bit about enrichment and other uh, aspects of taking care of animals here at the zoo. So remember put your questions in the comments and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.